what is going on, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Gravity Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris. Thank you for choosing to tune in today. Hey, folks, we're keeping this conversation going, this time internationally. How do you stay grounded in a world full of noise and chaos? What are your foundations? Uh, well, maybe it's your faith, your family, some core values that when when the world is getting chaotic and crazy around you, which I feel like is is commonplace right now, what are the things that's going to give you an opportunity to take a breath, to gain some perspective before you start making decisions of what to do next? Well, today on the show, we're going to be hearing from emotional intelligence expert Amy Jacobson. She's going to be coming to us from Australia she actually is a contributor towards a leadership group that I'm a part of from Australia that I meet with once a month. And uh, she's uh, usually one of the contributing writers in that leadership group for the newsletter. And so I started reading some of her work there. I got, I got uh, pointed towards her book titled Emotional Intelligence. It looks like this right here. For you audio listeners, that won't mean a lot. But for the folks on YouTube, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. A blue book titled Emotional Intelligence. A Simple and Actionable Guide to Increasing Performance, Engagement, and Ownership. Folks, and here's the deal. When it came, comes to emotional intelligence, I, I realized that it doesn't just improve my performance and my thoughts at work, but more importantly, it, it fixes that stuff at home as well. And I say fix, that's probably not the right word, but it causes me to be more aware and to put me in the driver's seat of my emotions, of my actions, which leads to better relationships. And I don't know about you, but if that doesn't sound good, I don't know what does, folks, because I want to have solid relationships, especially in my house. But before we start talking about, or before we start listening to uh, Amy Jacobson, I want to talk about Warrior's Heart. Warrior's Heart is a substance abuse and PTSI recovery center located in San Antonio, Texas, and in Virginia, and they are warriors only. Now, that warrior class is, is kind of broad in reference to military veterans, active duty, police, fire, uh, corrections, EMS, emergency medicine. There's a lot of folks that do that same work, but they just do it from different points uh, in the kind of that emergency life saving process. And Warrior's Heart has a motto of of warriors healing warriors and that's their approach to it and if you've heard me talk about it before you've heard me say it's more like a ski lodge than what you might think of a a a post-traumatic stress recovery center It, it looks more like a ski lodge which is a great place for the warrior class to go start the healing process and to train up their brains on how to process stress better folks i i love what they're doing check them out down in the show notes Warrior's Heart. There'll be a phone number and a website. With that, let's get into this interview with Amy Jacobson. Amy Jacobson, welcome to the Gravity Podcast. Thank you so much, Chris. I am so excited to be here. Yeah, I am as well. I think it's uh, totally random too, because I didn't know who you were. I meet a police chief at a conference in Eastern Washington, and he invites me to a leadership forum from Australia, a place where, or, or, or a leadership forum that you are one of the main contributing editors or the, 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 you contribute towards every newsletter that comes out somewhere through that. I see your book, I read your book and that's how we get here. I love just how these different connections in life connect us with, with other people. I feel like it was fake, Chris. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> hey, Amy, for the folks that haven't heard your, fo- your voice before, and I'm going to guess there's going to be a lot of them. Because you're in Australia, I'm in America. Um, I don't know if my listeners have, know you. So if you don't mind, uh, could you give a, a, an introduction of who you are? Absolutely. So my name is Amy Jacobson and I specialize in emotional intelligence in the workplace more than anything. So uh, we know, though, that emotional intelligence goes across all platforms. Uh, but I'm based in Perth in Australia. I Probably the main work that I do is actually roll out programs 
within organisations across all industries just to help them, to help their teams to be more emotionally intelligent in what they're doing, but also in their processes as well. I love it. And like you already just touched on there, these are skills that that you're equipping organizations, people in organizations to learn, but it's totally transferable to home. Yes. It is. It, it, I always say, and I always preface all of my workshops as saying I specialize in emotional intelligence in the workplace. However, the amount of feedback that I get coming out of workshops where they say, oh, I could apply this with my partner. I could apply this with my kids. I could apply this. And even, you know, some of the messages that I've received, Chris, just even years after I've done sessions where people have said it's helped with marriages, it's, it's you know, it's helped them to be a better person. Uh, and sometimes, as we know, it's the people that we love the most that get the worst side of us where oh, we let down those guards. So, um, yeah, it, it feels nice to know that it's helping out the people that they love as well. Yeah, I wish that wasn't the case, but I can tell you from my own experience being a police officer and the stress related to that, that uh, when I showed up at home, I didn't use my filter as much. I, I'd be at work all day uh, exercising emotional intelligence and, and aiming at being a good communicator. And I certainly didn't do it perfect, but I really worked hard at it. And then I get home and it's like my default is lazy, you know, not lazy in all regards, but specifically in reference to communication and emotional intelligence, and I'm just shooting from the hip, and I'm not hitting the mark. Yeah, it, it it's like removing. I, I feel like it's removing that lid off the pressure cooker when you get home because you've you've held so much in, and especially if especially if you're not 100 percent comfortable in your workplace and you can't, and there is, you know, you haven't found that common ground to truly be yourself. When we get home, it's we don't often think about the impact that we have on the people that we live with as much. So it is really that, that you know, the, the lid comes off that pressure cooker and it just kind of explodes. And, and afterwards we think, oh, we feel so much better, but we don't realise that we've just passed all of that on to the people that we love and, you know, not, not thinking about the impact that it has on that relationship as well. Yeah, absolutely. When you step into organisations, do you find that emotional intelligence is common language now or are a lot of your clients, employees learning about at least the, those words and some of the specific concepts for the first time? I think that the words emotional intelligence are very popular at the moment. I think I think that they it has changed a lot. It's changed a lot over the last couple of years. So if I go back, you know, five, 10 years ago, emotional intelligence was seen as very soft. So it was kind of airy fairy and workplaces were like, no, we're not up for this. You know, we need to make money. Bottom line, bottom line, make money. Uh, where I think in the last couple of years, especially when we saw what happened with COVID and what happened around the world, uh, I saw a real shift in that originally the, the people that would contact me the most were your HR people, your, uh, you know, your human resources, learning and development, people that were creating training programs where the people that contact me these days, a majority of them are CEOs, managing directors, because what they tend to notice is that when the last couple of years happened and those really tough circumstances, for one, they realise that without people, you have nothing. So yes. there is no bottom line. There is no profit if you don't have the people that are there. And when situations like that happen, everyone's coping mechanism was so different. So you had leaders looking and saying, why are these people okay with it? But these people are really not okay with it. And, um, and I think it just, you know, it challenged all of our mindsets as well to think what's important in life. So people scaled back a lot. So I feel like when I walk into organisations now, they're so much more aware of emotional intelligence. They know it's important. They know that they should be doing it and they know that there's a gap. However, the understanding of emotional intelligence is still not quite there because I think their understanding of emotional intelligence before I start the program compared to what it is when they leave there, I quite often hear them say, oh, okay, that's what it is. I had no idea that that's what it was. So... Um, yeah, but it's definitely, it's growing. It, it, it's great to see it growing. It sounds like exercise and nutrition. I know it's good for me. I, I have an idea <laughs> of what it is. I did it at some point in high school, yeah. but I'm 40, I'm 46 years old now. And sometimes it's different now. 
I mean, yeah. ex exercise and nutrition is exercise and nutrition, but in some ways, the way my body is, it's just different. And so I love that CEOs are reaching out to you, that, that yeah. the chief executives are recognizing the value of training their employees on, on how to both manage their, or first of all, probably recognize their emotions, right? Is that the first step? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it, it's that recognizing partner. And I think, Chris, you know, the reason why some of these CEOs, if I just touch on that again, that the CEOs are reaching out is because, you know, when I look at emotional intelligence, I bring I bring a slightly different angle than maybe uh, some of the other emotional intelligence specialists out there in that I think emotional intelligence needs a bit of tough love, right? Like it, you know, it's not, sometimes we confuse it for it being, you know, everybody's happy every minute of the day and everyone's positive and life is amazing. And that's not true. Like it, it's not realistic and it's not genuine. And I think it's, it's helping people to understand that it's okay to have a bad day. It is okay to have a yes. bad moment. Being emotionally intelligent isn't about walking around, you know, happy every day and, and you know, and winning in life. That, that's, that's not what life is about and no one wants to be around that. So I think, um, you know, as you were saying, that in order to help people with emotional intelligence, that self-awareness has to be there first. And they've, we've got to be responsible for the fact that every emotion that we feel is a choice. It's not, no one can make you feel an emotion. It's its a choice based on our values and our beliefs and our emotional wiring, our neuro, a neuroplasticity and neuropathways in our head. thats It's got to start there. And if we cannot stand up and own that and take responsibility for that and, and kind of get that little bit of tough love when it comes in, then you can't be emotionally intelligent in any situation or to anyone else. Yeah. You know, you talk about that in chapter five, owning it. And I guess I haven't brought this up for, for the listeners. So this is a good time to bring it up. Uh, Amy Jacobson is the author of Emotional Intelligence, a Simple and Actionable Guide to Increasing Performance, Engagement, and Ownership. And when you, when you built on that in chapter five, Amy, uh, you said, I'm actually going to open it up. I was going to try to quote it, but I just want to say what you wrote. It says, it's not the day. It's not the circumstance. It's not the people around us that make us feel the way we do. Ultimately, it's 100% us and our mindset. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And it is really hard to get your head around, Chris. I think even for me, uh, you know, branching out and learning in, in that area, it took me a while to accept it as well because I thought, but hang on, like people will do things and situations will happen. And that is what makes me feel that way. But the way that it works is that in our in our minds, right, from the minute we're born, we have these, these values and these belief systems and the neuroplasticity or the neurons in our mind that are kind of racing around and when they connect and hit into each other, they create this neuroplasticity that creates these neural pathways in our mind. And these neural pathways are actually based on our values and our beliefs. So at the at the beginning of every one of these pathways is a is a trigger as such, and at the end is an emotional response. And I think what the reason why we tend to think that people or situations can make us feel a certain way is because many of us that are brought up with the similar values and beliefs will react similar in different mm. situations. Yeah. But we know that if you take 10 people from around the world and you have the same thing happen to those 10 people, you are likely going to get 10 different reactions. Oh, wow. And that, that, that proves to us, right? Like, even if it's the same emotion, it might be on a different intensity level. It, uh, you know, so that proves to us that it's it, it's not like the situation. It, it's not the situation of the person that's actually pushing the emotion onto us. It's the situation of the person that is happening that actually hits a trigger in our mind, and that in our mind, as soon as we hit that trigger that's been created based on our values and beliefs. We follow the neural pathway, which then leads to an emotional response, but we've created that emotional response connected to that trigger based on our values and our beliefs. So that is why, you know, some of us can be in a certain situation and feel like it's okay to do that where other people like it's absolutely not okay. It is not okay. And you can even see it through, you know, religions. What, what's okay to one religion is not okay to another religion. 
And that is because our values and belief systems have actually created that. So it's it's not that situation. There is there is always going to be those things that, you know, those terrible things that happen in life that we are going to react very similar to. But it's not because of the situation. It's because we've all been brought up with the same values and beliefs to know that that is wrong. So we've wired our mind to tell us that that is wrong when that happens. And that is why we respond in that way, not because of the situation. Yeah. Wow. Recently, so I I had a rough summer, 2023. I got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Don't like that term. I like the whole post-traumatic stress injury because that's really what I see it is, uh, see that it is. But one of the things that I've gotten triggered recently on is if I'm in a store and someone starts being a jerk to the customer service person yeah, and I'm watching this and the mm-hmm. last time this happened, like I'm like doing some breath work, right? <laughs> because, yeah. because I'm, I am aware I am owning the emotion. I know how I'm feeling right now. I'm starting to get angry. I want to intervene in this. However, he's being rude he's not being assaultive. He's not touching the customer service person. And so I took some breaths. Well, as my wife and I walked out of the store, I, I decided to comment to her, hey, that was really starting to to make me upset. And she goes, really? Sarcastically, of course. And she goes, babe, you were wearing it. Like I could see it from head to toe. Your whole posture changed when that was going yeah. on. And so yeah. that's been something I've been striving to is one, owning my emotions giving myself grace, like not beating myself up. I used to really throw a bunch of shame uh, on some of these big emotional uh, reactions, even within myself. So not even outwardly. Uh, And so I give myself grace, but then I also, in that moment of giving myself grace, I, I have to recognize that I get to choose. I get to choose how I act now. It's okay for me to feel angry that someone's being rude to the customer service person. That's okay. What do I do with my actions though? And and that's the important part in it, isn't it? It's uh, like I always joke about it and say, you know, that I teach this kind of stuff and I would never, ever call myself emotionally intelligent. Uh, and I do joke that my kids pull me up on it and they do. You know, sometimes I'll say something and they'll say that was a very emotionally intelligent mum. But they're right, right, in that act because I believe that emotional intelligence is not something that you either have or you don't have. It is a skill. And in every situation, like you said, Chris, we have a choice in how we respond. We can either respond in an emotionally intelligent way or we don't. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. And beating ourselves up is is not the right way about it. Being self-aware and looking at it going, okay, I didn't respond how I wanted to in that situation. How do I improve? How do I learn? Or what do I do now? Do I need to apologize? Should I be doing this? Recognizing the situation is more important than trying to be perfect every time because we're not going to be perfect every time. And and, and that's okay. And, And, you know, and I say to some people, Chris, you know, In in the situation that you've just mentioned, you've got to look at it and say to yourself, am I happy with how I am choosing to respond when that trigger happens? And there are going to be some situations where you do respond with anger that you are completely happy with, that anger is the right response. Maybe it's not the right severity. Maybe you're a 10 out of 10 rather than a 2 out of 10 or a 6 out of 10. But anger is not a bad emotion. We have anger for a reason and it does belong in certain situations. And I think to to think that we need to wipe out anger is wrong. So anger is there for a purpose. We've just got to ask ourselves in those moments where anger is being triggered and we are choosing to respond with anger, are we happy with it? And is it the right severity level? And is it the right, the appropriate emotion for this situation? Oh, well said, Amy. I really like that. Just taking away, again, since I use shame a little bit ago, taking away the shame from someone who feels anger, right? No, anger is good. It's just, it's much like fire. Fire's good. Not in my living room tonight. That's bad. Exactly. Right? But exactly fire. Exactly right. And my neighbor's backyard the other night when we were sitting around a fire pit and roasting marshmallows and having great conversation was amazing. It smelled good. It felt good. Yes. It created this ambiance. So, uh, I like that. The fact that anger is good. It just needs to be in the right context, the right severity. That's good. What? So I, I mentioned breathing. That's definitely one of the tools. I think I use that word pretty regularly. Tools that I use. 
yeah. to help regulate my emotions, to, to create time. I'm yeah. feeling, I'm feeling a certain way. I want time so that I can make a decision on what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Do you have other tools that you equip, um, that you equip businesses with that their, their employees can use to, to give them time to make that decision on how they're going to manage their emotions? Yeah. Look, a breathing is the number one that I would always give as well, Chris. I think when people say to me, you know, what is the, what is the quickest tip or the quickest thing that I could do to help my emotions? I always say breathing and pausing. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that is that breathing, we know the health benefits to breathing are just massive. And I think they're very much underplayed in our society, just how important breathing is to us and what it does to our body and our functions. Um, so really slowing down, you know, all of that blood pressure and the organs and everything with us is going to help and getting more oxygen in is always going to help. But also what it does is that we have this thing in it that occurs in our mind and it's part of our wiring, right, in that we go into emotional hijacks. And that is when our emotional brain kicks in where our logical brain is yet to kick in. So it's kind of, it's the order in which the information is going into our brain and being, you know, analysed. And, and these emotional hijacks are real, right? Like they know that this is oh, how yeah. we're actually wired and they're going to happen in situations. So, and it's kind of that, that fight or flight response. It, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism that, that that's why they, that's why we're wired that way. So breathing and pausing and having the ability to be comfortable in silence, to just have that pause and be comfortable in silence. What it also does is it provides time for our logical brain to kick in rather than being driven by our emotional brain. So we know those, you know, those situations where you kind of, you say something and then you think, oh gosh, I really shouldn't have said that. Uh, and the reason why is that your emotional brain spoke and then your logical brain jumped in straight afterwards and said, why did you say that? So that pausing and breathing, even if it's for three seconds, will allow that logical brain to jump in and stop our emotional brain and take control before we say things that we probably shouldn't be saying. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, I sit there and think of a lot of examples where having the pause, the power of pause. Um, power of pause, right. And and that's hard because when, you know, when you look at it, we, we very much from the minute we're born, we're encouraged to talk. Like uh, we, we are in a society where talking is like talking is an amazing thing, connecting, interacting with people, communicating is an amazing thing. And I think, you know, we have, we've become very comfortable in discussion and talking and conversation. So to have that pause can feel very awkward at times, but I, I think being comfortable in who we are and being comfortable in the fact of being able to count to three and have that pause is so powerful for our own mind, but so powerful for the people around us as well, just to, to give them space to speak and give them space to really talk about how they're feeling and for us to actively listen. Yeah. The other thing I've learned recently, at least for myself, and this is not going to help anyone waiting in line and a guy in front of you is being weird, or a jerk to customer service. It's not going to help you if you're in conflict with your spouse or your children, but sleep. I have found that when I have, you know, seven to nine hours consistently a night, I'm showing up more emotionally intelligent. And I like the word emotionally qualified, not, not to replace emotional intelligence, but I like that term when it comes to, am I going to step into this conversation or not? And I really like that word qualified. It really relates to me and my policing background. I had to be qualified in certain things to do them. And then the times that I'm low on sleep, if I go and stack up a couple nights of five hours, I just feel it. I'm screaming at people driving by me, I, not not out, out the car. You know, it's kind of the inside the car scream, maybe yeah. four hours of sleep and I'd actually be screaming outside the car. I don't know, but I just see this huge shift in in my uh, my capabilities to manage emotions when I'm not getting good sleep. Chris, I am obsessed in this space of sleep. Uh, and I, I think... Uh, secretly, it comes from the fact that I love sleep and have always loved sleep. But So I think I actually started to look more into this space to try and justify to myself why it's okay for me to sleep so much. Um, but I look, I read a lot of books 
And uh, for, if anyone follows me on LinkedIn, you, you would have seen a couple of weeks ago, I actually did a post about the, probably, the, not even probably, it is the best book I've read this year. Uh, and that is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Honestly. I love him. It is a game changer. It mm -hmm. really is. And I think that it's changed for me. Like I already was really interested in this space. And as part of my programs, I always speak about, you know, the sleeping side because I think it's it's just so important and it's so uh it's not prioritized like it should. It's no. give you an example, even Chris. I was I was working in the medical industry last week and um I was actually working with high level like surgeons and anaesthetists and, and people who are in surgeries and, you know, doing incredible things to save people's lives. And we were talking about uh, the impacts of alcohol and drugs and how dangerous it is to have somebody in a theatre who is operating on somebody who is influenced or impacted by alcohol and drugs and, and everybody knows it right and it's you know it's that thing in the medical industry that you need to make sure that if that is the case that you get them out of the theater as quickly as possible and you make sure that they're not in there because it's dangerous and then I kind of spun that conversation to say well what about sleep because we know that the medical injuries industry is probably one of the worst right they are pulling 24 hour shifts they are doing yes. 10 hour surgeries without breaks like they are doing this these intense long very like very mind concentrating tasks and um and that's what i said to them like why are we not putting as much focus on sleep because if you've got somebody in a theater who has only had four to five hours sleep for four to five days in a row, they are the equivalent of being drunk, their cognitive brain. And, and even reading the book, um, you know, Why We Sleep and understanding that, you know, we say that adults need seven to eight hours of sleep, but even seven is not enough. Like if you have seven for 14 days consecutively, again, yeah. your cognitive DUI. mind. Yes. Right. It's just it it really changed the way, and and I think it's I think it should be, <laughs> pardon the pun, a big wake up call to many of us out there because uh, you know we don't sleep. We're kind of told that we sleep in order to re-energize, but we actually don't. Sleep is so important to our bodily functions and cleaning ourselves out and healing ourselves and you know getting rid of all of those excess chemicals and those even those emotions right even those memories like so much happens in our brain and our mind and our body when we are sleeping that if we are not getting enough sleep it's not just about energy it's actually a massive health risk for our mind and for our body physically yeah so for the listeners don't read why we sleep unless you want to like change your life. Like yeah. don't, don't, don't do it. But if you want to change your life, read it, but it is going to, it's going to cause you, if you really take it in, it's going to cause you to reprioritize the way you do things in life. Right now, my wife and I are in bed usually about eight to eight 30 every night consistently. Now we wake up at uh, about five o'clock in the morning uh, at least that's when I usually get up. She's usually up by 5.30. But again, it gives us enough time to fall asleep and then to have eight hours of restful sleep uh, before we wake up. And I'm telling you, it uh, it has totally transformed the way I think, the way I feel. My emotions are more regulated. Like before, I would kind of have these highs and lows, you know, good days, bad days. I have I have a lot less good days and bad days. I mean, I have good days, but I'm just saying it's not this roller coaster like it always was. But my job being a police officer and it moving schedules sometimes day to day, sometimes I'd be going from a night shift on one day and working a day shift the next day, which was just mind boggling. Yeah. Um, and I was operating off four or five hours of sleep sometimes, which was unsafe. Now, let me say That's this, right. because you did bring up surgeons. They do remarkable work. Mm -hmm. Look at our firefighters that are working similar shifts here in America. A lot of them are working 24 or 48 hours on, and then they're, they're getting double the time off. So if they work 48 on, they get 96 off, which sounds great, but mm -hmm. I don't want that amazing paramedic that I think so much of 
on zero sleep after a day and a half sticking an IV in me. He'll probably do it right because he's that he or she is that good at it. But I'd much <laughs> rather I'd much rather them get good sleep because long term wise, it's going to be better for them. And for me as the patient, it's going to be better for me. You know, it's fascinating too, Chris. I, I look and I think it's our industries that are saving lives, right? That are, that are doing some of the most incredible work are the ones that we're actually letting it be acceptable to do unless sleep. Yet you have a look at any other industry out there, truck drivers. Yes. Under such, they are under such strict rules to get sleep. You have a look at anyone working in mines or behind machinery, like every other industry we have said is not acceptable because of the risk to the safety. Yet in the industries where the safety is actually saving people's lives and, you know, and having that protection, they're some of the most important industries out there. And yet we, we're still making it acceptable. And this is, I have to say, next time I go in for any surgery, my first question to everyone there will be, how much sleep did you have last night? Yes. And if it's less than eight hours and balance in that non-REM and REM sleep, I'll be like, please, can I have somebody else? <laughs> I don't yes. want you operating on me. <laughs> right. And we really should. Here's the thing. Like I've, I found this within policing. Uh, sometimes officers would, we have a number of officers that have like uh, multi-discipline. So they're like a patrol officer or they're a detective, but then they're also a member of like a regional uh, SWAT team, special Wep weapons and tactics. Yeah. So they'll get called out at eight o'clock at night. They'll work all night on the SWAT mission and then they'll report to work in the morning. And they're not doing it because they're trying to be hazardous. In fact, the the more recent incident at my agency I retired from uh, they they came into the office and asked the supervisor, hey, where are we at for staffing, for minimum staffing? They were asking, can I go home? And the supervisor said, we're at minimum staffing. And all they said was, sounds good. And they walked out and got in their car to work because that's their heart. Their heart is, I don't want to leave our team short. I don't want to make you call someone on an overtime. Now, thankfully, when we heard about this, uh, the, the person who was supervising that day was a, a brand new supervisor, so not his fault. But when we heard about this, our leadership team got together and we were like, we got to send those guys home. And at first, actually, the top boss that day was like, they're adults. Let's let them let's let them make an adult decision. Right. And I was like, not when medical science says they're drunk. And this guy exactly. really respected science. And so when I when I was able to frame it in a respectful way, I didn't say it quite like that in a respectful yeah. way, I was able to frame Hey, this is what medical science is telling us. He was like, "Oh, wow, you're 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 right. Let's send them home. Let's call people in on overtime. That's the and we don't make those people take vacation either. Because guess what? We worked them all night, and so we can't expect them to work this shift as well. We're going to send them home on the company's time, and yeah. let them come back the next day. And I think that that's it, isn't it? And but wait, where are you were saying even when you said Chris, they're adults, and you know they need to make the decision. That, that's where our emotions cause us some issues, right, too, because it's that guilt. It's, you know, they know in their head that they should be going home, but it is the guilt of leaving the team short. It is the guilt of being, you know, not there and, and, and I guess, failing in a way that actually stops us. So it's in those moments that our emotional brain does take over and kind of convinces ourselves that, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay. You know, I don't want somebody else to be called in or I don't want them to do it short-staffed and, you know, a, a tired version of me is better than a no version of me. And I think it is our responsibility as leaders and as human beings to be able to help people to make that decision at times when their emotional brain or that guilt does kick in. We've got to help them out and actually say it is okay. Like it is it is the right thing to do and it is okay and this doesn't weigh on your shoulders. It is a decision made by us. Yeah, much like you said, just like uh, commercial truck drivers. We, we don't right. let them make the decision. In fact, they can get penalized significantly mm -hmm. if they're operating outside of what's acceptable. I, when you said that, I just started laughing because I've, I've thought that so many times. I'm a police officer that's going to write you a ticket for working too much, and I might be on 24 <laughs> hours without sleep. Like th That just doesn't feel right. Crazy, right? Absolutely crazy. And in worst case scenario, if something happens to that truck driver and they do have an accident and they end up in hospital and then they're getting operated by somebody who's been 
Like it, it's just a vicious circle. It's it it doesn't make sense. It's very contradictive. And I think I I would love to see the next 10 years really, you know, I think we've done really well in the past 10 years and even longer, focusing on the impacts of alcohol and the impacts of drugs. And I would love to see our focus now, similar to that, be put into sleep and the lack of sleep. Yeah, I love that. Hey, I wanted to go back to your book. I want to say it's somewhere in chapter eight. You, you're the kind of the bold heading of a section says everyone is a superstar at something. And I love that mindset. Can you tell me kind of where, what that means to you? Yeah. Uh, look, I see this a lot in workplaces and, uh, and I truly do believe it. I think that we all are superstars at something. You've just got to find that something. And it happens way too often that when I go into an organization or work with people or even just meet people, when we are in the wrong job and we are doing the wrong skills, it like it can make us look like such an underperformer or such a, you know, a problem to that organization. And I think we're so quick in workplaces to when people are underperforming or they're doing the wrong thing to go, how do we get rid of them? Or how do we force them to do the right thing? And it, it's been over the years where I've seen us actually, you know, I've had the opportunity as a leader to sit down with some people and who have been at organisations for so long and be able to really get them to understand what makes them tick, like how their mind is wired, because some of our minds are wired in the fact that, you know, that we like to do short, fast tasks and we just like to make things happen and we're, you know, quantity over quality kind of people. And that's me. Like I am a, you know, if you're going to do it, just do it. Like don't talk about it, just do it. Just do it. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge, sometimes I change for the sake of change. But there's other people out there that are wired in a very different way, that they're very analytical and they're fantastic at, you know, thorough research and their quality is just exceptional. And when you put people in jobs that don't align to their the way that their brain is wired or to their strengths, what happens is we start to underperform, right? It's that, it's that whole thing of, you know, like... Uh, I, I should never bring up analogies. My husband says I'm terrible at it because I always get them wrong. But I'm sure there's an analogy out there that talks about, you know, uh, how if, if you took a goldfish who could be a brilliant goldfish, right, so we were out in water, and then you put that goldfish up against a tree and tried to get it to climb the tree, well, of course it's not going to be able to do it because that's not what its specialty is. That's not how it's wired. That's not how its body makeup is happening. Right. And we, we take so many people in workplaces and we write them off because they're not in a job that aligns to their strengths. It's, it's you know, it would it, be similar to, if you look at the Olympics, it would be similar to taking an Olympic athlete in one sport and saying they're the best in the world in it and then putting them in a completely different opposite sport and then go, why are they not performing? Yeah. Like, why are they coming last? They're an Olympian. They should be better. So I think, you know, we spend so much money in workplaces, performance managing people and, you know, talking about and like, you know, really forcing them to try and do something that they're not wired to do. And then we spend all that money focusing on that to get them to push them out the door. And then we spend all the money on recruiting somebody new to come in, to train them up, hoping that they're going to be the right person, where there is such a missed opportunity to sit down with that person and work out they're already in our business, they know our business, what is the right task for them to be doing? Now, I just have to put a caveat in there though, Chris, like I am, and you've read my book, so you'll know that I'm like this. I am... I am not up for supporting lazy people or people who are choosing to take, to go in and do the least amount of possible at work in order to get paid. And I think that when people are underperforming, we have to call it out first because yes. they're getting paid, right? So yeah. I'm always a big believer in the examples that I use in my book, you know, what I've helped people before, the first step is me saying to them, if I'm going to help you, you have to start doing the job I'm paying you to do. 
Like I expect you to start performing and doing the job that I pay you to do. And at the same time, I will help you to find the right job for you. But for now, there's there's no excuse for people that are not putting in the work or, are, you know, are in a poor behaviour or bad behaviour at work. That's just not acceptable. But I think if we spent more time, even in ourselves, understanding, even in our younger years, what it is that we prefer to do, what it is that we like to do, and find jobs that are utilising those tasks and utilising that wiring in our brain, then you're capable of anything. You really yes. are. Yeah. Well, I really like that because what I hear you saying is, is we don't have to pick this or that. As a leader, I can hold people accountable to doing the job that I've hired them to and I can invest in them. I can figure out what they're great at, what their passions are. And here's the deal. I might figure out that they have a passion in a totally different industry. And then I hope as a solid, solid leader, I'm going to celebrate them as they transition over to that. Right. Exactly and, right. Instead of it being like, well, you're not going to be here. I'm just cutting you loose. And that's what I've seen. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I try to give leaders the benefit of, of, of the doubt. I try not to go into it with demonizing leaders saying, well, you're just a bad leader in, mm -hmm. in your experience. Why is the why are those conversations not taking place? Is it because of people being bad, or is it just that we haven't trained the leaders in how to do this process? It, it, we haven't trained the leaders. That, that is absolutely the answer to it, Chris. I think that you know when we have a look at leadership, we you know we are so quick to put people into leadership roles, and um, and you know like everybody, you know this, everybody out there knows that like we, we quite often put people into leadership roles with no training whatsoever, and we would never dream of doing that in a technical role. You would never dream of putting somebody into a technical role with no technical skills whatsoever. Yet we do it in leadership all the time, and when we put people into leadership roles, the technical part of their role is leadership, is people leadership. So you've yes. got to give them that training. And I think leadership has changed quite quite dramatically over the, la the last couple of decades because leadership in the past was very much authoritarian. You know, it was very, you know, this is what you'll do and you'll do it now. And it wasn't leadership, it was more management. It was do as I yes. say, not as what I do. Where leadership has come a long way and we're even seeing it now. And I don't, I don't know if you've heard about it over there, Chris, but we've just had a Royal Commission into um, the Defence Forces and the Army, particularly in Australia. Uh, and they've actually, from the Royal Commission, they've actually recommended, one of the recommendations coming out of it is that every leader that is in the um, Defence Forces must be must have skills in emotional intelligence to be in a leadership role. So they must actually meet these requirements and must actually show and show that they are an emotionally intelligent leader in order to be in a leadership role because of the impact that it's having on suicide rates on veterans. So yeah. I, I think leadership is changing and we're becoming more aware that it's not a do this, say this, you know, here's what you need to do. It's a great leader is adaptable. It's it's being able to understand what motivates that person, you know, what motivates one person is going to be very different to somebody else. It, it's it's understanding. And I think we've understood for quite a while at recruitment, right, that we always go into recruitment looking for those people with amazing special skills to say, wow, this person is really unique. This is fantastic. And then we bring them into the organisation and we push them into the same square peg hole that everybody else and give them the same KPIs or performance metrics, the same everything, and then wonder why they become bored or just become like another number in there and they lose all those amazing skills that we hired them for. I think that, you know, we are getting better in this space, but we still, there's so much more work to do in understanding truly what leadership is and emotional intelligence is that key part in leadership to understand and lead based on the person that's in front of you and the situation that's in front of you, not based on some blueprint that somebody has told you that this is what leadership is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, co I completely agree. I teach a leadership class for Washington State Police Supervisors, and it's a five-day class, 40 hours, and 24 hours of the class 
are what you would call the soft skills. It's emotional intelligence. It's taking personality assessments and and thinking about where your people fall in this so that you have a better understanding of how to lead them. It's about communication. Once you're emotionally qualified, now you can have all kinds of conversations. If you have trust, if you establish trust with whoever you're talking with, I, I sit there and think about uh, earlier in my career, I'd gotten involved in four, four, kind of one more time, four traffic collisions in about five years. They were all slow speed, but it didn't matter. The point of it was, is I was damaging city property and in, in getting involved in these collisions. And potentially I could hurt someone, right? If I keep doing it. And it was a, a sergeant that I really trusted that sat me down and said, uh, Chris, you're going to get fired. You, you, you are backing our chief of police into a corner. You're going to get fired if you don't figure this out. Real, I mean, like a tough love conversation. And I want to help you. I want to help you figure this out. And he did. He gave me a couple tools to start working on. I was journaling. Every time I drove the car, I had to write a little entry about driving the car and what I did and what I did either good or what I did that I needed to work on. But I just appreciated having a leader that was emotionally intelligent, that had trust with me and was willing to say hard things to me. And they're the leaders we never forget, right? Like yes. they're the ones that come with us our whole lives. And it is exactly what he what he said to you, Chris. That's when I look at that methodology of emotional intelligence, that is our first step. That's our own it, right? Like that is him turning around to you and go, you need to own the reality of the situation. The reality is if you keep on going this way, you are going to be fired. Yes. And then, you know, him being able to talk about those emotions and are you ready for this? But what leaders do really well is that feel it and ask it, which is the third and fourth step of emotional intelligence. And it's having the ability to be able to get out of our own head and go, this is not about us. It's not about being right or wrong. It's not anything to do with, you know, our ability. It's about being able to get out of our own head and understand how is this other person feeling and what do they need? What kind of support do they need from me in order to move through this? And what questions do they have? And, you know, what communication and what knowledge do they need? And what are the actions? And, and you know, him taking you through that feel it and that ask it and having that conversation with you then gave you the ability to drive it, that last step, right, which is doing your journaling. It's, it's actually pulling the actions out of there to say, okay, now I understand it. Now I know what it is that I'm working on. What are the very clear actions that are going to help me to achieve that? And that's where we see that process just coming through in every conversation. If we can understand that process, we know that going through that own it, face it, feel it, ask it and drive it, it's a continual process that happens in our mind every day so many times. And once you understand that, you can help yourself but you can also help the people around you to move through each step as you go so let's let's i really like you breaking down those other steps in emotional intelligence because you talk about this in, in your book different than in other books i've read and i really like it so own it we've talked really well about that i need to own my behaviors i need to own my emotions uh and then i feel it now is that me recognizing how i feel and also how the other person might be feeling in this moment so we go own it and then we go face it, right? So it. the five right. steps, so we go own it and then face it. Face it is facing the emotions that come up. So with every kind of own it situation, with every bit of self-awareness, with everything that we do, we know that we feel emotions every second of every day. Yeah. So face it is really facing those emotions. It's knowing that emotions are felt for a reason and ignoring them is not healthy. Ignoring them does not make them go away. It just literally puts them into the pressure cooker and they will explode at some point in time. Yes, so will. how do you face those emotions, understand where they're coming from and actually process them? So that own it and face it, we are very much in our own head. It's about us. It's about us processing and understanding it. It's not until we get past face it that we get out of our own head. So once we're okay with it, we've owned it, we've processed our emotion, we're like, yep, okay, we're okay with it now. We get out of our own head and we're going to feel it. And feel it is understanding how the people around us are feeling. 
Yes. So empathy. what are they feeling at the moment? It's mm. that it's empathy, but it's so much more than empathy as well. For me, it's, you know, it's empowerment. It's it's understanding what makes people tick. It's understanding the roles that they're there. It's understanding their strengths. It's, you know, yeah. it's so many leadership skills in it, in that feeling. And that's when it's, it, as I said, it's, it's just, it's not about us whatsoever because we're okay with it. It's about the impact on the people around us. So feel it is that real true leadership, not by job title, but by skill set, by human skill set. And then once we've felt it and we've, you know, we've let them actually voice how they're feeling, what their concerns are, we've thought about it from their point of view, we've empathized with them and we've empowered them, then that ask it is the fourth step. And that is the communication. And that is about asking the right questions. But more importantly, it's about answering the questions that are being asked of us. And we quite often skip this step with feel it, right, in that this is your communication, but it's realising that communication, it's not about us. Communication, the whole concept behind communication is the fact that you're getting one mess a message from one person to another person. Now, if you are sending a message and that other person is not understanding it, then communication has failed, Yes. And that's not on them. That's on you. You haven't communicated it in a way that they can comprehend and understand it. So this ask it is about asking the right questions. It's about answering the questions that are being asked. It's about having that conversation and getting that understanding through there. And then once we do that, we move on to the fifth step, which is drive it. And drive it is I'm okay in my head. They're okay in their head this is how we're going to make it happen. So what are those actions to moving forward and actually that motivation behind it? I love that. Thank you for breaking that down for me. I wanted to get back to one title that you have. It's in chapter seven and you say, others are not a failed version of you. <laughs> I, man, I was like, oh yes. I think <laughs> earlier earlier in my life, I, I sat there and I would I was the standard, right? It's very egocentric. You know, I'm you know, I'm clearly right. And and that's why we do it that way. Thankfully, through a lot of failures, I realized I'm not. Uh, and it's not that I'm wrong either necessarily, because there's that's a right. whole lot of different ways to do this life thing. So tell me more about uh, how others are not a failed version of us. This was my sledgehammer moment. And um, I like it wasn't even a light bulb. It was an absolute sledgehammer moment for me. And um, it, exactly like you said, Chris, you know, we do things the way that we do them because we believe that's the right way to do them. Like we wouldn't do it that way if we didn't think it was the best way or the easiest way or the right way to do it. So when we come across people who do it different, it really, it causes that, that problem, that concern in our mind, right? Because we're looking and going, hang on a minute, if they're doing it that way and it's working and it's right, does that mean I'm wrong? Which that's the last thing we want to hear, right, is that we could possibly be wrong. Uh, and I think it, 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 it challenges our mind to say, are we doing things the right way because someone's doing it different than me? And our natural defence mechanism kicks in and says, of course we're doing it right, so they are wrong. And this is where so much conflict happens, not just in the workplace, but even in the home, right? When, when we approach things, even as, you know, if we're parenting and we've got two different approaches to parenting, it's where a lot of the arguments and disagreements actually occur. And in the workplace, it's if you are not doing it my way, then you are wrong and therefore you're a failed version of me because in order for you to succeed, just do it my way. Like it's not rocket science, just do it my way. And for me, this was a huge wake up. I was, you know, it, it was back when I was quite a green leader. Uh, I, was, I was a young leader and there was, um, you know, the story that I share in the book was uh, there was another female leader that just drove me crazy and she just, she really pushed my buttons. And I say push my buttons, even though she clearly didn't push them at all. It was me pushing my own buttons. Um, but we were so different, two totally different leadership styles. And I really struggled with that. And, and I struggled with the fact that I had this belief of what leadership was and she wasn't doing it that way. And therefore she was wrong. Like, why isn't she a great leader like me? Like, you know, I'm amazing at this, just do it my way. Um, and, and it wasn't until I until I voiced it and um, 
and the person that I was speaking to was a facilitator of a program and she turned around and she said this statement to me and Chris it hit me so hard and it still hits me hard to this day when I pull myself into line sometimes and um, in, in all of my programs that I do it's probably one of the biggest one-liners that people take away that really hits home as well and it took me a long time to work on it because I also thought to you know when you're in a leadership role you feel like you feel like you're making a difference right it, it, it's yeah. it's it's a beautiful role to be in because if you feel like you're making a difference, it's huge. And and we all like to kind of think of think of ourselves as being irreplaceable. And that, you know, if we walk away, then you know, someone's gonna come in and they're not gonna do it the same way as me. And will they will they ruin and break everything that I've built in the last five to ten years? Like I've worked so hard to get the team to this point and to get everything to this point. And what happens if they come in and they break it all? And I realized, Chris, that leadership, like I truly believe that we have an expiry date as leaders because mm -hmm. there's only one real style that we can offer as leaders because it's the way that we're wired, right, and our ability yes. to be a leader. And people need a variety. And when we step out of a leadership role, the next leader that comes in isn't going to be the same as us nor do we want them to be the same as us because that team or those people are ready for a different style that I didn't cover. Yes. Something they've learned from me. I've given everything I can and it's time for a different style to come in. And I think that, you know, we've, we've got to get out of our own heads about thinking everything is about us and that our way is the right way. And when we can get to the point that, knowing that everybody in this world brings something slightly different to the situation and that is okay it's actually more than okay it is brilliant because it's what it's what actually fills in those gaps it's what makes us all different it's what creates brilliant amazing people in situations is having that variety and it, it's hard but when we can come to grips with the fact that other people are going to do it different and that does not make them a failed version of us. It just makes them different and it is okay to complement each other rather than being clones of each other. Yeah. And I sit there and think about that on the flip side as well. I don't need to mimic other people. Now, I've certainly learned from other people and there are some things that I've went, wow, I think I could lead in that way as well. And it works. But I had to get comfortable with myself and recognize that there's some things, some attributes of other leaders that I admire, but I can't pull that off. It's just not, it won't be authentic and it won't yeah. be, it just won't be true to who I am. And, and so being comfortable with that, and then the beauty comes is, is if we have leadership teams. Uh, and all I mean by that is, you know, on every team I was on, there was always someone in charge and then usually a second in charge. And I loved it when either I was the second in charge or, or my second in charge was a little bit different mm -hmm. because usually the team was better because of the contrast. And, right. and I even would try to, I would even try when I was the, 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 the head person, I would try to, to lean a little bit into their leadership style to where we blended together enough that, that the team felt like they were working for the same person, not completely, but you know what I'm saying? They don't feel like they're working for like, Oh my gosh, two yeah. totally different people. They, they show up to work and it's kind of the same person with some unique attributes. The balance, right? It's yeah. is finding that synergy that you can come together. It goes back to the whole, the yin and yang, right? Like how do you take the best of two people and bring them together to actually have that synergy rather than have that conflict? Because we do naturally, like as you were saying that, Chris, I thought I thought of my uh, a situation where I had right in that when I uh, a few years ago I did a session. I did an emotional intelligence session. I, I tried a couple of sessions for teenage kids at high school because I I do believe that we don't do emotional intelligence in high schools well enough. Like we don't do it at all in America. <sighs> I know, and right when we need it the most, when our hormones are going crazy, when the pressures increase, we push IQ so hard without the EQ, right? So yeah. I went in and I did a couple of talks for a year 11 and year 12 students just to kind of to try and get them to think that 
life isn't about chasing a job title. It's about understanding what makes you tick and finding things that align with that. So there's many jobs out there that will align with it, but don't chase a job title and a pay packet because that does not define your success. Yeah. But Chris, I quickly realized after doing these two sessions that I was not the right person to deliver these messages to these mm. year 11 and year 12 students. And to begin with, I kind of reflected it on as a bit of a failure as me going, well, you know, maybe I'm not maybe I don't specialize in emotional intelligence. Maybe maybe this isn't working because I it really didn't hit home to these kids and I don't felt that, I didn't feel like I had control of the room. I didn't feel like they, you know, the messages were getting through. But it was a moment for me to be able to look and go, my style does not match. It does not align with students that are at that age. They are they're not ready to hear it the way that I deliver it. And there are other people out there that are amazing at it, that they just, their style, their delivery is just perfect for students. It's perfect for those for that age group. And I think it's being able to understand that just because we don't fill every gap, it does not make us a failure. It just means that I've got a certain style and that tough love is great for workplaces and great for adults but not so great for teenage students. And, and, you know, there'll be some people in workplaces that my style is not right for, and that is okay. And that's why I'm not the only emotional intelligence specialist in this world, right? Yeah. Like it's, it, it's accepting the fact that we have, it's being comfortable with what we have to offer, but know that we don't have to be everything to everyone. We don't have to be, the greatest leader to every single person and be able to solve every single query. That's why there are other incredible people in this world to tap into, to partner with, to, to work with, to bring into the situation, to create that balance and, and being okay with that within ourselves. I think that's a great way to end, Amy, for folks that hadn't heard your voice before, what are the best ways for them to connect with you? The best place is probably LinkedIn. Uh, it is the one social media platform that I'm most active on. You'll find me on the other ones, but I'm really not that active. So LinkedIn and my website. And Chris, I, I always say this, I truly do mean it. I absolutely love connecting with people. I love chatting with people. I love hearing stories or and learning from other people as well. So you can find my contact details all through my LinkedIn and all through my website. And I would welcome and be more than happy for you to reach out, have a conversation with me, send me a message, give me a call, what, however you like, however you like. I'm, I'm always up for connecting with people. Well, I can attest to that because I reached out to Amy in a very similar way. So for folks, I'm going to make this really easy for you. Look down in the show notes, Amy's website and her LinkedIn profile will be down there. Amy, time is my greatest commodity. I can't make more of this stuff. And you have given me an awful lot of yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I have thoroughly enjoyed our chat. It's I been awesome. as well. Have a great day. You too. Folks, I know I say it, I say it all the time, but I am constantly amazed by this opportunity to meet people from all around the world and to listen to their perspective, what keeps them grounded. And personally, my life is getting better because of it. I really love some of the stuff that Amy had to share there. The fact that others are not a failed version of us. Oh, yes. And that everyone is a superstar at something. Let's figure out when it comes to our, our staff, when it comes to people in our family, let's figure out where they're a superstar and encourage them in those areas. Hey, Jamie and I want to hear from you. How are we doing here on the podcast, folks? There's a few different ways for you to communicate back to us. First and foremost, please follow us on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. That will cause the next episode to come up in your dashboard. We'd really also really appreciate if you would rate and review us. There's five stars waiting on our main page on Apple and Spotify. We'd really appreciate a five-star rating if, if we've earned five stars. And if we haven't earned five stars, folks, you've heard me say it. Keep your stars. Instead, shoot me an email at chris at gravityct.com. Let us know how to make a better future marriage Monday topics or guests for me to interview. Folks, we only get to live this life once. Let's go out and take care of the people in our tribes. Take care of each other. God bless.